Hello everybody, James here. Story time with Dutch Mantel, episode 69. And I can see already that Dutch Mantel is ready to do a plug. How could you tell? I, hey, uh, this is my University of Dutch diploma that you can have for yourself to hang on your wall. And it's actually, it looks, James, how's that look? That looks pretty good, huh? Yeah, it looks very glossy and shiny. I like and, it. And the, and the only thing not is not on it right now is my signature is Dirty Dutch Mantel and my also known as name, uh, Zeb Coulter. And you can hang that right on your wall. And it comes in a nice holder just like this. And you got it. So write me at Dirty Dutch Mantel at gmail.com and I'll get one right out to you. There you go. And also, if somebody wants signed books from you, they go to the same email, and those books are indeed over your left shoulder, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. I have two books as well. Owen Hart, King of Pranks, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, the two best biographies ever written on those two particular gentlemen, if I do say so myself. We have T-shirts in the old place. Uh, I still haven't done pro wrestling T's yet. One, when I get a second to myself, I'll try and do it. But, uh, oh, Dutch, I mean, like, just before we even went on, I was getting phone calls filled in about, like, just house renovations and stuff like that. It's driving me nuts, but I could bore you to death with that, but I won't. My toe's still black from when I dropped a dining table on it, and that was about five, six weeks ago. <laughs> Folks, James has had a tough time the last month and a half or so, so... We haven't really kept you up to date on it, but hey, that's a podcast of and uh, in itself. Mm, Correct, could, James? I could yeah, do, we could do I that. could do an entire podcast on house renovations and why not to do it. I mean, I've right, already so given away the we, conclusion. We got a lot of news to cover. Jesus. A God. lot of people to disagree with and a lot of people to piss off and make mad, but but one thing you one thing we can say here people get our undivided opinion and it's not wishy-washy back and forth. It's one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So if people don't like it, they can come back at us and then we'll come back. And, but you know, the best angles in wrestling for the last three or four months hasn't been amongst the talent, the wrestlers. It's actually <laughs> been amongst the podcasters. <laughs> that son of a bitch. I didn't do that. Blah, 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 blah. So, but it is, it's entertaining to to read that stuff. Yeah. We've not helped though, have we? I think we've helped stir the pot here and there on occasion. Mm -hmm. Okay. I so, got it. So let's get into some news. And, Good. Uh, the first bit of news isn't really news as we know. It's not new, uh, but it's a follow-up to what we gave a story on, on either Tuesday show or last Friday show. I'm sorry. I can't remember uh, which one, but J.R. Foley follow-up. So, we said last week that something to the effect of, or you told me, and I didn't, I couldn't think in, if it was true or not, or I couldn't really remember the details, so we sort of just brushed over it, that uh, there was a rumour going around that John Foley, J.R. Foley, had his daughter's leg broken because she had been in a car accident and they wanted to get a bigger insurance payout. Now at the time, Dynamite, yes, yeah. Now at the time, you said maybe it was one of the Hart family. Now, Ross Hart, hello, Ross, by the way, who's a regular viewer listener. He wrote to me and sort of gave us a bit of clarification on the whole matter. Now he said that it is actually true. John's daughter Michelle was in a car accident, and in order to make a bigger claim against the insurance company, John asked Dynamite Kid Tom Billington to break her leg. This would have been in the very early 1980s in Calgary when John was managing Tom and the rest of us became aware of the incident after the, the fact. John wrestled and managed from 76 to 79 before becoming a full-time manager of Tom, Big Daddy Ritter and Hercules Lyra in 79. Tom first arrived here in the spring of 78 as a babyface until switching heel in 78 to be managed by JR. Turns out that Dynamite really was a natural heel <laughs> then if he's willing to break a leg. So I heard about this years and years ago, and that's when I first started learning. Don't let anything in wrestling surprise you, but it did because I know Michelle. I knew her when she was a little girl. I used to be a, a partner of John Foley's when we worked up for uh, 
Ron Fuller up in when he first started uh, his territory, his new brand new territory in Knoxville. I was there with John. And then, but when I heard that the, the stipulations about this or the, the facts about it, he had had an accident or she had had an accident and they wanted a, a bigger settlement. So they decided to break her leg. And I've never heard anything like that in my life. And I went, no, bull crap. That did not happen. But now, well, I found out maybe about 10 years ago that it did happen. So what, what can I say? Is it, am I surprised? I am still surprised. But in reading, you sent me something this morning. You're reading. See, this is what I think when you break somebody's leg, you take it and you go. Yeah. I mean, it's very violent. But by the way, it was described on that uh, piece of paper you sent me this morning or that report that you just you can actually do it with your with your fingers. So I don't know how you do that, but did you you wrote that right? No, so uh, no, no. You, Ross Ross actually wrote that to me. By the said, way, well, how do you do that? Do you know what's really weird? Right, is that really hit home with me? So what Ross said, and by the way, I did ask Ross Ross's permission to. Uh, you know, mention his name and bring it up what he said. He said that essentially what you can do to break the leg is to basically hyperextend it so you so you press down with force on the knee itself and then like that. Oh, I can do it. Do you, do, do, you know, do you know what really freaked me out about that is that I, I still go to physio, by the way, you know, for uh, my knee rehab after the ACL uh, <laughs> thing. And that's what the physio is doing to me that Monday. That Monday, he was pressing with like all his weight onto my knee to try and get it straight because I've still got like five degrees of uh, of uh, uh, I can't quite get my leg straight still, and that's what did he was it, doing. Did it. it hurt? Oh yeah, killed. Wow, it was really really painful, and I was like, I didn't but, quite tap out. Uh, but where did you get this report from? Uh, which one of the brothers? Ross Hart, the historian Ross. of the Hart family. Yeah. Okay. Did did they get a settlement? I didn't ask. Say, we need to I know. Have... We need to know the rest of the story. Okay, Ross, please write. In fact, I'll just get in touch with him. But Ross, please get in touch with us and tell us if he got a settlement and how much. Uh, Ross also made mention that uh, his dad, Stu Hart, had actually booked you to come to Calgary along with John in the autumn of 76, but you cancelled because uh, he believes that you were doing well in Florida slash Alabama, wherever you were at the time. Yeah. But it also sounds well, like you just couldn't be bothered making the trip. Oh, exactly. <laughs> this is what I did. This is years before map quest and all this stuff. So I got a map down <laughs> and say I was in, say I was in uh, Memphis so I got the track in Memphis all the way to Calgary and it went up and it went up and it went up. And I said, nah, because it gets very, very cold in Calgary. Mm -hmm. It gets like 20 below, maybe more 30 below. And I hate cold weather. So upon further review, I'm like an NFL football game now mm -hmm. upon further review, your offer is d denied. Thank you very much for your cooperation and your due diligence and all this kind of stuff. But I was, <clears throat> and that was the only time I ever talked to Stu Hart. I used to hear people, you know, they would try to imitate him and I don't know exactly what he, what he sounded like, but he sounded exactly like the people who were trying to imitate him. So, but I never went uh, to Calgary, and I never regretted not going. So, do you not do a, an impression of Stu? I mean, you did one of Jim Barnett last week. Oh my boy! I, I got to think about Stu. Yeah, it obviously. I'd, I'd, I'd have to, I'd, something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was something like that. It was like. Staccato time. Gag, 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 gag. <laughs> I can do a good one of uh, Bushwhacker Luke. Go on. There we go. Gag, 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 gag. <laughs> oh, and you say, okay, Luke, get it out. And I love Luke. And he, <laughs> he gets to talking sometimes. And But very 
entertaining type fellow with, with a lot of great stories. See, that's where I got my stories for all these for all these these two books back here. I got it from talking to the guys, and they told me the story right up. And I all I did was I just memorized it and put it down in a book. Otherwise, the stories in in my books would be lost to all eternity, <clears throat> basically. But now they're they're uh, put in here for all uh, for forever. Mm. So you can always go back and look it up. Now, I forgot to put this. But in I this. do, but oh. I do want to know what that settlement was. Okay, Ross, let us know. Um, we will move on. And I can't believe I forgot to put this in the script. So, <laughs> Rick Flair. Would you believe that Rick Flair has? Go on. I think a lot of people don't know about this. No, it, it only happened recently as well. So um, I know, but I don't even think they know who the comedian is. Okay, so I'll tell you what then. I'll best do a bit of reading a, a, out Explain then. this, because I didn't know who the comedian was. So, uh, a chap called Brent Mason actually sent us... Uh, it was very uh, prescient. Uh, I know you like that word. I, uh, I do so, like that word. Timing. Uh, he emailed last week and read his question out on Tuesday's episode about uh, a man called Tony Hinchcliffe, who's a comedian who had announced that Ric Flair and he were going to do a series of podcasts in front of a live audience and it was going to be a little series, and that it just kept not happening and not happening and not happening. Anyway, a few days ago, a video was released, or a couple of days ago, I can't remember, uh, and um, it's a show called The Goat and the Pony with comedian Tony Hinchcliffe. He gave us, uh, Brent, uh, thank you very much, he gave us a really good uh, write-up of this as well. Now, the format of this show, The Goat and the Pony, is essentially they get comedians from the audience, pretty much, to do, like, one-minute set. And then if they like it or they don't like it, and then, you know, they rate it, and if they like them, maybe join them on stage, that kind of thing. The guest of this week was Rick Flair. But now, he wasn't a comedian. He was just a guest on a panel. Well, people were laughing at him. I understand that, but... <laughs> But he didn't get up and try to do a set, right? Exactly, no. He was sort of like the guest panellist of the week. So, uh, would you like me to read the um, summation that Brent has written us, or would you like to take over? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, then. So, Kill Tony is a podcast filmed weekly at a comedy club in Austin, Texas, in front of a live audience. Tony Hinchcliffe has a prominent stand-up comedians as guest judges each week. The format of the show is that anyone can put their name in the bucket, and if their name gets pulled, then they have to do one minute of stand-up comedy. Then after their minute, they are interviewed and critiqued by Tony and his guests. Lots of jokes are made at the expense of the comics, who do their minute by Tony and the guest judges. Some of the jokes can be brutal. It is all done in the name of comedy, giving up and coming comedy pros- uh, pr- uh, sorry I'm reading this by the giving up and coming comedy prospects a shot at getting discovered now Rick was the first guest judge introduced last night and the crowd was very much into him at first Rick never seemed to really understand the concept of the show he was speaking off topic texting on his phone and had no interest in being on stage when he wasn't the focal point at one point the comic judges thought Rick Flair had fallen asleep but he was just texting and I think one of them started calling him fun Joe Biden at one point as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we? So at one point, the comic judges thought Rick had fallen asleep, but he was just texting. He was also drinking and had been drinking prior to the show. As Tony Drinking? Ref- Would you believe it? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but... Oh, it's, it's fine. Um, so uh, he, he, Tony uh, explained that he tried to tell Rick the premise of the show seven beers earlier. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, The other thing, I can read more, but I'll leave it at this. The show is never heavily edited, but last night's was. They had to cut around Rick's rambling several times. Now, you've watched, you told me you watched about 20 minutes of this. So what did you see and what did you think of it? I saw Ric Flair sitting there and he's drinking as usual. And he got up finally and just walked off stage. He made some kind of a, Kind of trying to make a speech about something, and it was about his dead he just, son. He kept bringing up Reed right? Flair, his dead son. Yeah, and it's meant he, to be a comedy kept, show. It's supposed to be a, a comedy show, but he kept bringing up Reed, his son who passed away on a uh, on a drug overdose, and it was just it was just a classic failure. Where can people find this? 
they can find it on YouTube, The Goat and the Pony. Uh, Tony Hinch, just search Tony Hinchcliffe, Ric Flair, you'll find it. But the entire okay. episode is up, and it's like, I really, really... Like, I, if if I know something really embarrassing is going to happen and then someone tries to tell me to watch it, I can't do it. But mm-hmm. I did watch this, and it's like, he starts talking, like, dead seriously about... Re- I mean, he's, he's pissed as a fart. Drunk, drunk, by the way, and that's, that's how we say it over here. And then at some point when he starts bringing up Reed again and talking about his, his, his son who died, one of the in-house bands starts playing sad music on the piano. <laughs> Now that's a little bit. They, they shouldn't have done that, but but Rick just he he embarrassed himself and got up and left. So if you haven't seen it, which I don't think you have, anybody, go and watch it. Draw your own conclusion. And it's just another thing in the long line of Rick Flair embarrassments. I think. See, Rick Flair is over. He knows he's over. People like him. If he would just shut the hell up sometimes, stop the drinking. And I thought he, after he had his heart attack and he was, everybody thought he was going to die, he gave up drinking. Oh, I'm not going to do it anymore. You know, I think he wants to die with a drink in his hand, which is his, his right, I guess. But if you want to try to get better, don't ask people to feel sorry for you if you're not trying to, not trying to help yourself. But anyway, this was another another look inside the world of Ric Flair and it's interesting, but you say a lot of things about Rick, but one thing you can't say, you can't say he's boring. He's good material for the podcast. I'll give you that (laughs) because he's not boring. He's not. So, but I'm glad you found that now the people on through the efforts of you, I'm going to put you over here, James, through the efforts of you, all the people can look into probably something you wouldn't have seen. Uh, well, to the efforts of Brent Mason also for giving us that write-up as well. I, I, let's mention one more thing about Ric Flair. That obviously, he's on some sort of slow public spiral to the bottom. But, I mean, when he tried to like come back with that podcast <laughs> with Mark Madden for a bit, and he managed to... And Mark Madden even said, I knew when we started this would be the end of our 30-year friendship because he's just off the mm-hmm. deep end. And then he started doing the podcast with Conrad again. And a lot of people posited that because Ric Flair is his father-in-law, Conrad really, really, he has to do it. He's obligated to like kick up this podcast again with Rick. And keep mm-hmm. in mind, Rick is not a good podcaster. I would like to see, and I think the people would too, I'd like to see you do a, a podcast with Ric Flair. I'd be too annoying. I'd have to do it really early in the morning, catch him when, you know what I mean, when he's still Oh, that's the worst time. He's still asleep. (laughs) He don't get up before one. Maybe, but... uh, 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 I would love to see that. But even even Conrad isn't doing podcasts with him really anymore. So it's like, what's going on with Rick? Like, he's he's been given basically the gift of life a second time. Okay, if the news came out tomorrow, God forbid... It happening, but Ric Flair died of a heart attack. Would you be surprised? No. No, I wouldn't be surprised either. I hope it doesn't happen, but but he's not trying to help himself. I don't think he gives a shit. I, don't, I really, I don't think he does. And I think he goes out and he tries. He does this on purpose. You think? But... Because you don't care. No, oh, no, but this is. Are you, are you of the opinion that like all publicity is good publicity, kind of thing? Because this. No, just, I'm not. Because no, that's going to cost not. him some bookings, surely. Yeah, I don't. Listen, I think Rick should try to upgrade his his stature a little bit, but he don't care. I don't know who handles this stuff. He didn't handle his own stuff, does he? No, he's got to have a manager, surely. Does his does his wife do it? Ex wife, you mean? No, he's married again, isn't he? Married to No, divorced again. I think they are anyway. Hope they're not just well, who... like separated, but I mean I thought they got I thought he got divorced a fifth I thought time. Con- I thought it was Conrad's daughter or something. What? No. No, 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 no. The last woman he married was uh she played Fifi the Maid in WCW in nineteen ninety three. And then somehow they like link back up after twenty okay, years. Okay, what is married. his what? What is his connection to Conrad? Conrad married his eldest daughter, I think. That's where it, 
I reversed that. Okay, mm-hmm. I got it. So, but good luck, Rick. I love you, brother. I love you. Next one. Now. Well, I really don't love him, but you know, that's, <laughs> just, that's just for general consumption. No, so. that's, that's fine. Uh, WW releases two dozen performers. Now, I'm going to get through some of the names that we probably don't have anything really to say about. So, Mansoor, Mace, Shanky, Dabakato. Uh, Ulysses Defecator, Leon, who? Defecator, uh, very, very <laughs> unpopular gimmick. Oh yeah, that's a sneaking gimmick. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, it was the shits. <laughs> I hear. Okay, come on, I should be on. And that was, I should no, be on that. That was good. Yeah, that get was rid of, good. That get was rid good. of Ric Flair. I could be on that stupid comedy podcast. Oh yeah. Uh, next one. Uh, <laughs> well, Defecator, uh, uh, Ulysses Leon. Daniel MacArthur. I've not heard of half of these. A lot of these are like NXT guys. Kevin Ventura Cortez, Alexis Gray, Brooklyn Barlow, Ekerman Giro, NXT, 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 Dana Brooke, who I've heard of, Aliyah, who I've heard of. So let's get to the names that we'll have something to say about. So I thought I'd do a little surprise for you, Dutch. One of the names is Top Dollar. You must have seen on SmackDown here and there he was released. Yep. Any Any opinion on him? I loved his move when he did the, the, the stomach top rope move. <laughs> and he hit perfectly, I swear to God. He hit perfectly and got to walking. It looked like, actually, he made it look good. It was a big botch. And we'll talk about botches in a minute. Mm. It was a big botch, but he recovered from the botch perfectly and walked down the aisle. Should we see it? Yeah, let's look at it. On set. Okay, we've got the video ready for you, and here we go. This is what we've been. When I saw this, I thought it was one of the best recoveries from a botch ever. He hits the rope, comes over, hooks that big belly and over the top, and there he goes. He's walking away. Oh, I jumped up. I says that was the best recovery from a real, a real botch that I've ever seen in my life. But he gets released because you know you can see a group come on. I mean, not just me. I mean, just just fans, regular fans. But this group never never kind of touched me in any way. I didn't see them going forward. I saw it was a uh, almost I call maximum male models was uh dead on arrival. These what were these guys called top dollar? What were they called? What was the name of the group? I can't remember. You put me on do I have to look this up? No. Okay. But anyway, they they were dead on arrival too. I don't care what they did with them, and sometimes and people get disappointed when they get released. But that's life. Not everybody makes it to the top. Damn it! I'm looking around, and I, I made the mistake of on airplay mode in my phone, and now just a barrage of text messages have come through. Um, forget it. I can't Is it called Top Dollar? Uh, yeah. Well, not really. But that was his name. I thought that was his name. Oh, that was his name, but I don't know the group he was with. Anyway, let's forget about him. We've got to go with the next one here, and this is someone who piqued your interest before because we were just chatting about it before we recorded, Mustafa Ali. Mm-hmm. Now, he was probably the only person who had been fired who actually had like imminent plans for him. So he was going to be facing Dominic Mysterio for the North American title on uh, the September 30th show in NXT in Sacramento, which he now isn't, and he was scheduled for... Other matches as well, including against Rey Mysterio. The only fun thing about uh, Mustafa Ali is he's the only person in this list who publicly asked for his release previously, and it was denied. So I don't get that. It was it was something like eighteen months ago or two years ago when there seemed to be like a raft of wrestlers like posting publicly they wanted to leave WWE, and mm-hmm. WWE let let like nearly none of them go. Um, so he's got his wish now. Some eighteen months, two well, years later. Okay, I'm reading. See, fans have a different way of reacting to when one of their favorites gets released. But, and we'll we'll talk about the the boo personality in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But, but a lot of these guys. Let's say Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler, and I may have said this last week, and I, I did put it up on my X account. It seems like he's he's been there since Vietnam, the end of the Vietnam War. He's been there forever. 
really almost 20 years he's been there, which is almost a record. Now, I don't know what his deal was, but say he was making, say, let's say $750,000. I'd say more. <clears throat> I'd say more. He had such a million, I, I bet million 1. dollars. 1.5, let's say. Who knows? Okay. I went on the short end because, but most of, a lot of that time, he didn't even leave his house. And all of a sudden, he's not going to bitch and moan about getting released because he made tremendous money for doing zero. I don't even think they called him up on the phone and asked him, asked him his idea on anything. So he he's not going to bitch and moan. And it's, it's like pro football. You know, pro football, like coaches and guys, they get hired to actually get fired or traded. And I ask all this is so he will can, and he can continue his career. See football players, pro football players cannot continue their career because they, they don't have another league. They do have one, but I don't think they want to mess with it because the money's not there, mm -hmm. but he can continue his, his career. He can go, he can still go to Japan. He can still go to a bigger independence. He, he can do that stuff. So somebody said, well, he's too talented. He should be on the main roster. This is the analogy I came up with. I used to live in Nashville. Every Friday and Saturday night, you could go down to Second Avenue in Nashville and listen to the, the music coming out of those clubs. Every one of those guys could be on the main roster at the Grand Ole Opry because they are that good. But somehow they don't have the connections or they don't have the, the political power to get them there. So a lot of them just make a career out of working second, second Avenue. A lot of those guys, they work five and six clubs a night. They'll start about eight o'clock and he'll go and they'll play an hour at one club. Then they'll go down two blocks down the street, play at another club from nine to 10. And they do that all night long. But, and that's the same way, that, that, that's the same way with wrestling. I mean, wrestling is what you make it. And some of these guys make it and save their money. Some guys don't. But I have no control of that, nor do the fans. Let's stick with Dolph. Uh, he was in mm -hmm. the company at the same time as you for uh, several years in WWE. I don't know mm -hmm. how many run-ins with you or chats with him that you had, but any stories with Dolph? No, he was a... I wasn't, I, I would sit down and talk to him sometimes. Very pleasant. He's a sharp guy. He re, he really is. So, and he's going to take what the environment gives him, the business environment gives him because once he got his money up, now you can either do something with me or you won't do something with me. But yet the money does not change which is a big difference from years ago because you either you got paid and this is when it was just paid off house shows. You got paid on the number of people in the crowd or the number of dollars in the gate. But now since it's a different business model with W W I E, you know, you don't do that. You got guaranteed money. And of course they're not giving him all that money. He's making it. I mean, he's available for everything. Plus, they're selling all of his gimmicks. They're taking care of all of his uh, uh, his T-shirts and this, that, and the other. And all that goes back to make up what they call the downside. So whether he works enough to, to uh, actually earn that, all his other stuff is all added in. So they got it figured out. Mm. So... I find it incredible. Let's say it's like one point. Let's say it's a million or one point five million, whatever he was, especially in the later years. Okay, wait a minute. Is it one million or one point five? I'm guessing. Pick, you're conf you're confusing me. I'm, let's say one million. Let's, one okay, million. let's say a million a year. He's he's making okay. a million a year, for the most part, especially in the last couple of years, to sit at home and do absolutely nothing. Fair play to the guy. Would you? I'd love would it. Would you do it? Of course, would you I'm do it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I'd do it. I know. Yeah. I mean, it's a great gig. I mean, I'm sure like he could be frustrated and stuff, but I, I knew a guy. He worked on the he worked on the ring crew. And they kind of forgot about him. <laughs> 
And he's been kind of sitting at home for the last couple of years. And they never call him to go anywhere or they never say this. It's almost like he's forgotten, except he's getting paid. So what a deal he's got. Mm. You know, the, the Iron Sheik was in WCW. And I don't know how this happened, but he's glad it did. I think he had an automatic rollover if they didn't make an, an, an effort to rescind it or to renegotiate it, it rolled over automatically. And his rolled over, uh, I think he was, and this is 20 years ago. 30. Or more. This is like 90, 1990. Well, it's it's 30 years ago. I think he was making $250 back in those days. And it rolled over. So he made another half a million and they forgot about him. I think... The story I heard is almost exact, but I heard he was making one twenty-five a year, and then it rolled over, and he got paid another one twenty-five to make two fifty over the course okay. of two years. And then, uh, and then in the second year, they tried to bring him back to TV, and he was so bad they just sent him home again. Yeah. One thing about my stories, you know, never let facts and stuff get in the way of a good story. Just roll with it. And- you ought to said, no, I heard he was making 300000 no, We've been arguing oh, over no, Dolph no. Ziggler's money, for, and neither of us know. <laughs> no, I don't know, but I don't know how they can how they can pay that much money and then not ask the guy to do all that much. I know. Have too he much went money. To NXT. Have too much he's money, been, that's he, how you do it. He, yeah. He's been down to NXT, Dolph, what, a year or so, two years? Yeah. He's, that, he's yeah. been down there. Well, but more power to him. Good guy. Yeah, uh, I'll end on this. Apparently, he was someone that Vince McMahon never really saw top star in, which sort of explains uh, his ascension. You know, he could be world champion to absolutely bottom of the pile the next year. So he just a sort of schizophrenic mm-hmm. sort of booking in that sense. Anyway, the next one we're going to talk about is Elias. 35, uh, apparently he was high school classmates from Pat McAfee. I didn't realize that. Uh, mm-hmm. He was signed in 2014. Uh, he was the drifter. He does the guitar thing. He goes on the main roster. He starts feuding with John Cena and stuff. And like pretty much everyone else on this list, in the last couple of years, he's just basically forgotten. Why Elias? I, I, I thought he had something going for him. Well, I, I, since you brought this up, and we're going to talk about Boogs next. <laughs> now, Boogs was is a guitar player, correct? Yeah. Elias is a guitar player. Yes. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they ever put these guys together? Like dueling banjos, something like or that. Or something like that. And because both of them are great guitar players, they need to tell the story. Said so they were in a band in high school or in college or something. I mean, somebody would have to dig deep and to, see if that is true or not, which I doubt doubt it is. But I don't know. You take two guys, and how often do you see an accomplished guitar player in wrestling? You don't see it very often. Man Mountain and, Rock. He was in the like, mid-90s when you were there, you know, with the WWF guitar. Yep. Probably before Elias, it was him. Mm-hmm. And i tell you what I would have done. I would have put those two together, and then I would do a, a guitar off. You know, you could do it in a house. Who plays the best guitar? Then you could have added a banjo player. And you have your band, and just take it from there, and just see how the people like it. The two guitarists and, see, the and deal, a banjo when you player. Do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the jug band as well? Maybe we could get them involved. <laughs> and then you film them up around uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, up at Dollywood, <laughs> up up in those mountains, and they're sitting around. Do 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 do. To me, it would be interesting as hell. It's what I'd do. And here's Dutch Mantel on the washboard. <laughs> hey, that's not funny. That is not funny. I'm not. I'm not even laughing at that. But, <laughs> but those guys have a talent. So I don't know why they don't make as much as they can out of the talent. At least it would be entertaining. Mm. It would be. Yeah, he seemed to have quite a lot of steam on him, old Elias, when he turned up. And as I say, you know, he was feeding with Cena and stuff like that. And then I think he was feeding with Jeff 
I can't remember it anymore. But what was the thing missing with uh, Elias then? Was it the in-ring? Talent. Mm. No, they really, seriously, they didn't really give him a chance. He did that in-ring th- deal with the, the, the spotlight. What did he even talk about? Good question. I know he talked. Why did you put a spotlight on him and he didn't really... I don't know anything that came out of that. What if he had a spot? Here we go. We're booking again. Mm. He has a spotlight on him. All of a sudden the house goes dark. His light goes out. And all of a sudden there's another spotlight and there's boogs. (laughs) And they're both, then they start playing together, you know, like, uh, what was the name of the movie? Deliverance. 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 And, Put them together. I would have. I would have considered that entertaining. Of course, I don't know how far they can go with that, but at least it's better than what they were doing. I don't think we get to the squeal like a pig moment, though. That might, you know, for the PG WWE. You are, you, you are too much. You, the squeal the like a pig. I did like Deliverance. I saw that movie when it came out, and it was it was different. It really was. I'm going to bomb you out here. I've never seen it. You never seen Deliverance? No, never seen it. Well, it it covers every stereotype you think about a white mountaineer type person with the accents and one kid uh, had Down syndrome, but he's the one that could play the banjo. Hey, I read about him not too long ago. He's actually, he's about, I guess he's 50 something, has a job doing something. He's doing well. Hmm. So. I don't yeah. know what his name is, but that made him for life. Okay, continue. Uh, we've got two more. I don't know if you've got any real things to say about them. Shelton Benjamin and Riddick Moss. Either uh, Anything you want to say about either of those? Well, Shelton, great athlete. But again, they have a lot of great athletes in WWE. That's why they're there. Hmm. He was... He had no personality. Let me say that. I mean, there's a lot of people that are great wrestlers and you could probably tell some decent stories with them, but they really won't get that mass appeal. They won't get that mass. uh, uh, I mean, if you did an angle with them, I mean, I don't think he could get the people behind him. Hmm. And now who was the last one? Madcap Madcap Moss. Yeah. That was dead on arrival too. That was kind of a his jokes were weren't even funny. I mean, it was maybe a, a rib you could say, hey, that's okay. But there's nothing to grab you. Then they put his girlfriend, Emma, mm-hmm. put them together. And I said, Well, at least that's something. And I'm guess like every other wrestling fan out there, I, I'm thinking, well. Who can they run them against? Because, and you, you get to thinking running through your head, but they didn't do anything with them. And then the next thing I know, they're gone. Did you ever do any, because uh, we're actually going to make uh, mention Emma next, actually, to Neil Dashwood. Uh, the story on her is she was already with WWE. She left for a few years. She, I think she was in TNA um, at one point. Maybe Was she there when you what, were there? What was, her, what was her? To Neil Dashwood. I think she was, well, I was only there for a year, mm. I think. I can't remember if she was there at the same time you were there, but she ends up back in WWE in 2022. Mm. And the sort of sort of unintentional comedy of this is an hour before she's released, uh, she promotes a poster saying, can't wait for WWE to return to Perth, Australia. And then uh, because she's Australian and, you know, she was going to be on the card, of course, you know, the hometown girl and that kind of thing. And then an hour late, she finds out she's, been fired, and then she just tweets out, uh, never mind, forget it. Just been released. Mm-hmm. So it's like the worst time tweets in the world, maybe. That's it, I was saying that didn't age well. Yeah. <laughs> it aged like at, milk. At all. So, and she, after they put out in Perth, Australia, it's coming. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then an hour later, she puts out, what? Forget about it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, never mind. I've, I've been released. Oh. Within, an, I promise you, an hour. C- couldn't have been worse timed. 
Okay. Do you do you think she was the one who put that first tweet out, or was that the company put it out? No, or maybe someone told her to put it out. Oh, that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting thing. What if someone in the company told her to put that out there? And oh yeah, maybe I may conspiracy. Never know. Hey, I love conspiracy theories. See, I hate them. I know oh, you I love them. them. I love them. I love them because it gives me something to talk about. And brother, if you want, I, I bet if you got in a car with a bunch of wrestlers. Say four wrestlers, which is no less than three, and start them talking about conspiracy theories. Hell, you may have that car pulled over about 20 miles down the road and guys get out and start fighting. <laughs> I mean, now when I was there, it was uh, a, a it was a lot of Democrats and the Republicans stayed kind of quiet till the election, and then Trump got in. Uh, it really got rough then. Hmm. I think at one point they had to, they had to, I don't think we, I didn't hear anything about this on the outside, but I think they told guys to stop talking politics. Oh, really? Cause it was, no, it was driving a wedge between them. They was having to work together. And all of a sudden now they got different political views. Now they don't like each other anymore. And it was, it, it, it's too much. It, it really is. So I remember one guy down there, he was a Trump supporter and he was doing like a, uh, some kind of a, not an army gimmick, but something Jackson or, you know who I'm talking about? Like, no, I'll I'll have to look that up. Someone else will know. Go on. Yeah. But, you know, he was having a lot of trouble backstage because, when somebody would say something to him about Trump, he was a big Trump supporter. No, well, he would just launch into it and they'd launch back. And it got to a point they had to just say, well, you got to stop this. Ezekiel Jackson. Does that sound right? J- Jackson. No, with a J, uh, something with a J. Okay. Something with a J in I- an army thing. And he had a partner and they got it released. I wonder why. Hmm. Or well, maybe they but, didn't you know, post it, the Australia but poster. But it would, it, it would seem like in WWE, since Trump and Vince are good buddies, seem like, uh, but I don't think Trump gives a damn about him getting elected or not. I'm sure he donated to his, to his, to his election. But what Vince, where he wants the money to come in is... He wants to see those house receipts and those pay-per-view receipts and what they pay out. He's more business-oriented than he is politically oriented. Mm-hmm. Guess who we're going to talk about now. Your favorite. Who? Rick, Rick Boogs. A uh, real name. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, I love his surname, Eric Bugenhagen, which is just a fantastic surname. I love it. Uh, Hagen, uh, A former oh. college wrestler at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, double uh, NCAA tournaments and stuff like that, and uh, powerlifter, and gets into WWE in 2017 and on the main roster mm-hmm. in 2021. Most, in fact, well, I'll, I can continue afterwards. But anyway, of all the people who got fired, uh, Rick Boogs was the one who uh, raised, I won't say ire, but raised your eyebrows the most, or maybe even the least, actually, I suppose. What did you post about Rick? I forgot what it was, but he he was acting all all mad and pissed off and and I, I didn't see it. Pro wrestling has pro in front of it for a reason. It's a job. <laughs> and if you're going to get all pissed off and say, well, there was a conspiracy. You're talking about conspiracy. Mm-hmm. He said they were somebody who didn't like him and that they wanted to, to get rid of him because Vince liked him. Vince liked him because of the body and all that kind of stuff. And but he said as soon as Vince out of power, then and, and he blames Vince going out of power as ruining his career. Well, I think that was a little bit dramatic. I don't think I think why he lost his job is because not because somebody didn't like him. I think somebody just didn't like what he added 
which he didn't add that much, but he, he did. He had a hell of a body, but again, there was, there was no downside to him, to me. Upside. See, because they, they didn't, uh, well, either way, upside or downside, he, he stayed the middle anyway. It did, didn't matter. If they'd have done my gimmick with him, yes, with him and Ezekiel playing the guitars together, that may have been a different story. But they didn't. So, and I, th I think it, a lot of people got kind of teed off at me about that. Well, let me read. But it's but it, but it's hell. It's just an opinion. It's just my opinion. Calm down, people. Down. Let me uh, let me let me say what you said. I'll give you a quote, and then I've got uh, Boogs's comments as well. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Dutch just read where Rick Boogs blames his release from WWE due to a backstage political power play. Eh, I blame it on lack of talent. Boogs now <laughs> is being considered for an on-screen spokesman for insomnia. Take two pills and watch a Boogs match eight hours easy at WSI underscore YouTube. See, that's good marketing. Mm. If you can't sleep, they say take these two pills, pop in a Boogs match, <laughs> about five to ten minutes later, you're gone. You're gone for 10 hours, eight hours anyway. So I, I thought that was that, that was good marketing. And a lot of people said, oh, you, why are you happy because somebody loses their job? No. Wrestling is not a job like a regular job. It's not. I hate to tell people that, but it's not. But And here's a guy probably making. What do you think he's making? He was making. I I'd shudder to even have a go. I mean, obviously six figures, but I don't know. 300,000? Who knows? 250, 350? I don't know. Okay. Well, and guess how many tickets he sold, probably? Go on. Zero. Mm -hmm. He was just in the He was just in the group, oh. and he was being paid off that. I've, I've got a couple of things to sort of bring up to you. I've got the quotes from Rick Boogs okay. here. I'll read them in a minute. But uh, as I looked... Okay, there's two things. One... I think you watched the WrestleMania along with me the year before. Or maybe not, actually. You watched this year's. Forget it. Anyway, he managed to do... His old thing was like, you got someone on his shoulders, and then you do like a front lunge and then step up again. You know, that sort of like John Cena, look how mm -hmm. strong I am kind of thing before you do, do the move. You know, like John Cena really, you know, pick up Big Show or something like that. And then at the WrestleMania last year, he tried to have both Usos on his shoulders, and he tried to do that front lunge into a sort of half squat, and then come back up again, and then his knee just went <laughs> and just shattered, and sort of left Ooh. him on the shelf for nearly a year. And when Boogs came back, is that kind of thing that creative doesn't really have anything for you, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then he just did nothing in the company before they released him. So, see, you can see that coming six months away. Mm. You can just see if they don't have anything for you, they either leave you off TV or make you like invisible in a tag match. You can see that coming. So, but he had to expect this. He, he had to. What did you think? Because you've been watching SmackDown for the last, I know, 18 months fairly intently. Did you have any opinion on Boogs being the hype man, guitar man for Shinsuke Nakamura? Well, first of all, I didn't like the song. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like that because, and they wouldn't change it. He's a musician; he can play guitar, so they could have easily. And that was uh, Nakamura's theme theme song. But again, they needed they need to change that up to keep my attention. And he didn't do anything. Nakamura would go to the ring and do it. But he did nothing to garner my interest any more than where it was. I'll give you the quote again in one second. I'm going to throw something at you here. So, in my opinion, for what if, I'm dodging, whatever that's I'm worth, dodging. Yeah, yeah, whatever that's worth, you've got a, a bodybuilder, yep. legit amateur wrestling career. Yep. Plays guitar. Football player. Football player. Football player. Yeah. Plays guitar. Yep. But as far as his character goes, bodybuilder, amateur wrestler, he wears the singlet, he looks like an amateur wrestler and bodybuilder, then plays yep. the guitar. There's something just completely incongruous. I know you like that word. About that. It just doesn't mesh right. It just looks wrong. So he's out there in his singlet playing guitar, and I sort of never got that. I Elias looked right playing the guitar. Man, uh, 
Max Payne, I can't remember, uh, Man Mountain Rock. He looked great playing the guitar. He looked like the type. But for Boogs, yes, he can do it. But just because he could do it, should that have been part of his character? Because it looked wrong for, to my eye. He got released, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> and everybody else had the same opinion on him. Not everybody else, but some people liked it. But it's, does he have that mass appeal? He didn't have it. I hate to, I hate to tell him that. Hell, I didn't release him. The company mm. did. But before the company released him, the people released him. Because you know how they judge how over you are? By the I've told you this before. Mm. Well, that's one thing. Guess what else? Ratings? Gimmicks. Gimmicks. Uh-huh. They they get all those numbers back from the gimmick tables. Oh, LA Knight is doing wow, he's right behind Cena. And all of a sudden, LA Knight, I like him. I've known him a long time. I like him. I like his I actually like his whole deal. But if he wasn't selling gimmicks, they just overlook him. They would. And L.A. Nats, you can't say that he is definitely one of the, the top wrestlers or performers in his in-ring work in the company. No, he's not. But he's got that uh, that mysterious uh, feel to him that people gravitate to, and they like him. So, And I was thinking on SmackDown the other night when they was beating the shit out of damn Cena, I kept waiting for – L.A. Knight to hit the ring. But he called COVID and he wasn't there. Unless it was for the COVID, he would have been in there and that would have been the next evolution of L.A. Knight making him a big star. He was like number four or number three on what we call the merchandise table, the gimmick table. And they look at that, they read it, and they pay attention to that. The numbers they do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, one more thing on booze because I kept threatening to read this quote from uh, that this is per fightful anyway. Uh, on Vince McMahon's temporary removal from WWE, this is Boog saying, I can say with 100% certainty that the removal of Vince McMahon killed my career. To a fan who claimed WWE is going after Vince's legacy and trying to make the t- take the testosterone out of WWE, Boog said, I can't wait to give my opinion because it sounds like we're totally on the same page. So, mm, to a fan who said his character wasn't very good, well, that's your opinion, which is all that business was. Opinions and politics, a lot of people tell me I was their favourite, mainly their kids' favourite, which is the way it should be considering it's a PG show. Also, aside from my time with Vince, the character wasn't even given a chance, etc., etc. A couple more quotes. On the notion that he was released because he was too big, as funny as that sounds, you're not totally wrong. So apparently he may be released because he was too big, according to Boogs. And to a fan who says WW dropped the ball on him, pretty much everyone in the corporate side of the company agreed, which is why I was always the third-party guy doing commercials for Old Spice or Snickers, Mike's Hard Lemonade and Toyota. However, one person clearly has some weird grudge against me. Now, keep in mind that there's only one person who's going to fire you I don't think that's true still, even with the merger, is Vince. Do you think he's maybe saying Nick Khan fired him and not Vince and wrestled control well, I think from tri- Vince? I think, I think Triple H did it. Yeah. That's what I think. I don't think Khan has that much to do with the, with the actual talent. I think he just handles what Triple H gives him. Now, what he said there is possibly true. When Vince got out of power... There went Books's power yeah, but because he was six just months, Vince is back, essentially, and he can stick and... his oar. He can stick his oar in the creative still, he, and he, he has. He could, he could, but I think they're trying to keep him out now because. And I heard Vince is going to sell all his stuff anyway. Mm. So what does it matter? But anyway, what he's saying is that Vince was his big sponsor. When Vince went out of power, so did Books's power. I agree with that. What else did he say? Uh, a grudge against him? Yeah. Do you think uh, that's likely? Conspiracy. Mm. That's a conspiracy theory. So we can be, let me think about this a minute. Hmm. Yep. There's something to it. Mm-hmm. So, but th- that's the beauty of wrestling. <laughs> because you never get the truth. You'll get close to it. You'll get around it. But nobody's going to put 
Triple H uh, under the oath where he lays his hand on the Bible and said, was it true, sir, that you had, you had a heart on her bugs? <laughs> but <laughs> and Eric never Bugenhagen. But it made the news. And without news like that, guess what? We have nothing to talk about. I know. I know. I know. You know, you have uh, uh, all those dirt sheet writers and they have nothing to write about. So they love this stuff. So, okay, then, Dutch, we've got one more firing, and this wasn't with the raft of firings. This was like a day or two later. Matt Riddle. Now, Matt Riddle is a complicated case. Uh, announced on September 22nd, he was one of the more popular characters in WWE over the past several years, but Riddle has also had several accusations about his conduct in relationships uh, made against him, with several women coming out over the years to describe him as abusive, with one resulting in a since-dropped lawsuit. He also has had a contentious relationship with his now ex-wife. Uh, he's done a stint in rehab after multiple wellness uh, policy violations, with the last straw seemingly being an incident at JFK Airport, where he was allegedly drunk and ended up in a confrontation with a police officer. This was the incident where Riddle uh, claimed on social media that he had been violated by Port Authority staff. Yes. They were. Gro gro groped. Exactly. Someone was trying to, you know, predict the future by squeezing his testicles or something like that. And then WWE claimed uh, Riddle was sick for a couple of weeks when he missed Raw, and then they fired him. So Matt Riddle then, uh, his entire career from what you saw, because he was on SmackDown for quite a while. Yeah. He was he was a different character. I kind of liked his character, like his, like, hey, dude, anything that come along, it was okay, he would handle it. But he did have some depth to him. But once that I was saying he's his own worst enemy, they had they had plans for him. Now, he's the type that had it all laid out for him and was in a good spot. They were going to use him, but he goes around, he gets busted for drugs. He, yeah. Didn't he, didn't he take a test and he tested positive? Several times for wellness violations. It's, it's well known he's an advocate for the marijuana. Mm -hmm. So if, let me ask you this. So if you get busted with marijuana in your system, mm. they can get they can take you off the road? They can... It used to be a fine. It's, it's, it's legal. It used to be a fine, but, I mean, if he's, like, gone up against like the wellness violations it may not have been weed it may have been something else yep so uh, they don't I, I don't know if they really announced that kind of thing uh, or if it's just more generic he's been, been suspended 30 days he has to go to rehab that kind of thing well he was an odd case uh see instead of people getting upset over guys like boogs and what's that other guy ali mm-hmm Matsu Mita, what's his name? Ali. What was his name? We Mustafa. Talked about? Oh, yeah, Mustafa Ali. Prince Ali, something is See, he, Ali Papa. They ought to be talking about Riddle and saying he had it on, he screwed it up himself. I have zero sympathy for him. I hate it. I hate they got rid of him. But you got to have rules, I guess, or as rules, we just throw rules out of the window now with this new woke culture. I mean, Guess, go down the street and rob a store, bust in, take it. You can get by with that. But, you know, you got to have rules or the world doesn't work. So if you don't have rules, and I, I, I'm i glad WWE kind of, again, I'm not glad he lost his job, but I am glad the WWE said, hey, man, we've gone as far as we give you every, every chance in the book, and you're just not going to work out. You're more trouble than you're worth. And they told him and let him go. Mm -hmm. I sort of think that Matt's almost got like a Jeff. I mean, I hate to say there's a, a few correlations with him and Jeff in that sense, but uh, Matt's sort of like Jeff in the sense that he's just Jeff. naturally, Jeff Hardy, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just naturally charismatic. You don't even have to do anything particularly interesting for just to get the people interested in him. He's just one of those people. So it seems a shame I mean, I understand why, obviously, but it seems a shame that they've got rid of Matt. And uh, I wonder what I wonder what the future holds for Matt because if he goes to AEW, that could be 
you know, people could be up in arms there. But then they got Jeff Hardy on the roster, so. Well, it would be interesting. But AEW, they don't tell stories, really. They they show matches. And they might tell one story, and then they may tell it or they may not tell it. But they haven't had any story with any depth. And I'm saying like the bloodline story, but mm -hmm. I'm not even saying that in depth with it. They hadn't even started on any kind of a story like that. Sometimes the story will get you through and you don't even have to have wrestling. I mean, you can't do that every week, but the story will carry you through. I learned that years ago in Memphis. If you got the story and you talk the story. See, I think in Memphis, we used to do interviews that if you were going through the room and somebody had it on, let's say me and Law were in kind of an interview argument, we would argue like we was in the back room. And it became interesting in a while. And somebody was, oh, that was a good point. Boy, we had, that was a good comeback, just back and forth. So if you leave the room, then you, you just can't stay gone. You got to come back in there and said, I got to see what happens here. And then, and that's what they would do. I mean, there was, when you have two good talkers and they can engage each other back and forth and both of them are making valid points. The only thing missing then is your match. Then you book the match and you take it from there. Do you know? So, who, do you know who had a good story? And you'll be able to talk about this because you were watching it. Randy Orton and Matt Riddle, and that's a great example they, they as well did, as that they had they, their plan. They did. They did. They had their plan. They were going to do the whole breakup thing in a while, and then yep. someone put their finger up and went, took the temperature of the room, and then listened to the people, and probably mm -hmm. like you were saying, was looking. We're looking at the gimmicks, and then thought, do you know what? This team's got actual legs. Why did that work? And, well, Randy got hurt again, which uh, uh, which uh, kind of upset the, the timing of it. Everything is timing. Mm. Everything in life is timing, and wrestling especially. But Orton and Matt Riddle together, I think, had tons and tons of potential. See, Orton is so over, he could just look at Riddle. And let the people put their own <laughs> words in his mouth. He didn't have to say anything. But you could tell if he was mad, pissed off, or he wanted to kill him. So, and they could have worked that, got him over, give him the tag titles. And but as it worked out, they kept him on the on the on the Usos. And it it, it worked out just because one line of strategy doesn't work. The other line did, but I would think the Usos versus Randy Orton and uh, Matt Riddle would have been a, that's the type of angle you can take for a month, two months. And then you interweave it back and forth. And then you can have, you can have Orton uh, again. And, and Orton was the only one that Roman Reigns didn't face. Mm hmm you could have built Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns to a big, big pay-per-view, like SummerSlam or WrestleMania. You know, the big the big question now is, what is uh, Cody Rhodes going to do? Now, you had brought this to my attention before, and I haven't written in the scripts. Now, with Cody Rhodes, I think the story's was looking like it was going to be that he had to go to WrestleMania 40 to avenge his loss and then to finally defeat Roman Reigns. But now with The Rock coming back, that gets a lot more confusing, especially for Cody Rhodes and LA Knight. Yep. So, Cody, but with Cody, I don't think it hurts him at all. Because remember Dusty's old theory, Hard Times? He's got to fight the political wars too. Now, that kind of fits into the, the Cody's, you know, theology, I guess. 
and he's having a hard time, but he's getting through it. And he can, he can keep that alive. L.A. Knight, they're going to have to make some adjustments on him. Do you think they'll make they'll ever make L.A. Knight the, the champion? I don't think so. No. I don't either. Why not? It is something. There's something. He's, he's, he's well, I don't know. Let's see how, what, what happens in the next two months. Let's see what happens. How would you? I, I know. See, you, you can't judge two months in WWE because they're, they're looking two years mm-hmm. is what they're looking at. And they say, well, why do they look so far ahead? Well, they got to get all their merchandising together. Who are we going to be pushing in eight months, nine months? Oh, hey, what about top dollar? <laughs> no, wait a minute. They fired him two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but they get a, they got to get all that in play. And if you knew that, if you knew the merchandising uh, regimen or the scheme or who they're going to s- start pushing, because creative tells them, and they start making plans for that. If you knew that, you would you would know a lot more than just people hanging out in the dressing room. Let's say you've got two months with LA night. So obviously there's a difference between being over and then being looked at as the person who can dethrone Roman Reigns. How would you or is it possible to heat up LA night to the point that you you know business will stay good or even better if LA Knight defeats Roman Reigns for the title and he becomes a new face of the company and the new champion. What would you do as a booker to get him to that next stage? LA Knight? Yes. Uh, That's a risky, risky undertaking. Before, Before I would do anything, I would have to look at another guy, which is Gunther. I think Gunther is their next big project. Because he has the size, he has the work, he has the look. He's German or Austrian or whatever he is. He's international. So, and I've said this before, and I don't know how many people out there remember this guy, Johnny Valentine. But he is the second coming of Johnny Valentine. Johnny Valentine would go in there and literally beat the shit out of his opponent. Now, they made a lot of money. He went to Charlotte, the Mid-Atlantic Territory, and this was, oh, years and years ago. See, most guys would go in the ring and main eventers. They, they'll give you 15 minutes, maybe 20. Well, well, not Valentine. Valentine would go in and he'd give you 30. He'd give you 40, 50. And this is even on the, on the smaller shows. Say they were used to going to Greensboro, North Carolina, and drawing – uh, 19,000 people or however big that arena was, he might go to a smaller arena in an outlying town that may have 800 people just according to how he felt that night and how much the, the people were into it. He'd go 50 minutes because he was, a, a, you know, he was used to giving these long matches anyway, but, and somebody told me, he said that, he, he, he doesn't matter if there's 10,000 people in the crowd or if there's 100 people in the crowd or 50 people in the crowd. you got to give them the same match you would give the 10,000 number because it's not their fault nobody else came. They bought their ticket. They deserve a show and the best show you can give them. So Johnny Valentine, I'm going to tell you, this is the story I haven't told you. Okay. I haven't told anybody else either. They were in the Ohio Territory, which I've said before, they had 34 or 35 different territories you could work. See, let's say guys got fired now or released now. Well, they had 34 other places they could go get a job tomorrow if they wanted to. But they were in uh, Ohio, and it was one of the Alaskans. You can look them up. I think it was one uh, Jay, Jay. Jay York. Jay York, one of the Alaskans. We, we actually had... have told this story on this one, you know. Oh, really? Yes, we oh, have. It's... When I first heard you'll this story... You'll have to wrap it up, though. You'll have to wrap it up, though, because... I mean, you'll have to finish up the story because some people may not have heard it. He had... Uh... What did he have when you got a... Inhaler. 
And that is for what? Asthma. He had asthma. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. So, and when he came back from the the ring, he would be kind of huffing and buffing. That's first thing he would grab this Jay York, and he, and that would I guess his lungs were on fire. Johnny Valentine had a weird sense of humor. So one night, there's one town in Ohio. He went to the ring. Johnny Valentine got his inhaler out, and he put in. I forgot what he put in there. It was like lighter fluid. Lighter, think, yeah. lighter fluid. He put lighter fluid in there, put it back in his bag. Well, when Jay York came back, you can imagine he grabbed it and and it was lighter fluid. His lungs were already on fire, and it damn near had to take him to the hospital, and it messed him up for about two weeks. Mm-hmm. So when he came back the first night. I don't know how he found out Johnny Valentine did it, but Johnny Valentine went to the ring and he pulled out a sawed off shotgun and blasted Johnny Valentine's bag on the floor. Boom. He just ripped it all to hell and was sitting there with the gun when Valentine come back. And he looked at him. He says, if you ever do that again, that bag will be you. And of course, I asked the stupid question, did he ever do it again? And the answer, <laughs> of course, is no. But, and when I first heard this, I went, who in the hell would put lighter fluid in somebody's uh, inhaler? But Johnny Valentine did, but he never did it again. So no, that's once, one of the un, uh, untold stories of years gone by. Uh, just to wrap up the LA night thing before we move on. Is, is is he too old to get behind as your champion? Because I think he's like 41 or 2 or something now. I think he's 40. I think I think he is. But I think he is a hell of a challenger. But you got to be careful with this run because he may make this run and that's that's it. Because hmm. where's he going to where's he going to go from there? So we'll see. I'm I'm proud for him. I hope he gets hope he gets five years out of it. That's, that's as much as he could hope to get. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm happy for him. Now we're gonna move on to AEW. Now, this is something that bugs me specifically, as YouTubers, as you know, as we are. AEW and Don Stevens, aka <laughs> Aubrey Edwards. Now, yes. after the uh, concussion suffered by John Moxley at the tail uh, at the tailbone, uh, actually, I don't even know that was a mistake. At the t- at, at the hands of of uh, Ray Phoenix last week, it became the talk of the wrestling world, uh, including a number of YouTube and Twitter accounts showing the sit out tombstone pile drivers and the botch finish where the referee didn't count three, and then John Moxley just go just mm-hmm. you know because obviously just gave him the order to pin him. So apparently, this was also the last straw for AEW as far as uh, social media and stuff like that goes because they. Uh, got their crack social media takedown guru Don Stevens, aka AW referee Aubrey Edwards, to get AW botches thrown off Twitter entirely. Now that's one thing because I think we both followed it because we both love a botch. Uh, some people, you know, were in favour of it because you know it's really, really anti AW that thing, and then other uh, that, that that channel, and then other people were like, well, hell, if there weren't so many botches in AW in the first yes. place, there'd never be a Twitter dedicated to it. Uh, we'll get to the second part in a second, but what do you think of AEW in that instance going after Twitter channels? So they were going after YouTube channels. Uh, we'll now speak, they're going after... We'll speak about the YouTube one in a minute, but for uh, AEW botches being removed, yes. Yeah, they actually made uh, a copyright claim. That's really a... Uh, I guess if that's the rules... They can play by, I guess it's fair because it's not beneficial to their company at all. And they're looking at it, not necessarily through the fans eyes. They're looking at it through the sponsors lenses, how the sponsor people spending money on this show and they're seeing this thing on YouTube or they're seeing this uh, thing on Twitter that doesn't paint AEW in the best possible light. I can see that, but does it affect me? Eh, not really, but 
I don't know. It's either. I can't say yay or nay. I don't know. No. Is it? Uh, I don't. I don't mind them for protecting their intellectual property, but again, you you covered it. Hell, if they didn't have so many botches, they would be no material for them to get. And they do a lot of other shows too, right? Who's and that? that's where they're getting. Well, AEW does a lot of other shows. They do uh, Rampage, they do Collision, they do what? What's what? Yeah, some of those other shows. They, yeah, they do all those shows plus a lot of uh, others too. Mm. So they they taken they taken them from there. So if they didn't have so many botches, which I bitched about anyway, because I have read I don't know if this is true or not, but I've read that the agents tell these guys not to do certain stuff, and the talent says screw you, we're going to do it if we want to. Mm-hmm. When they get somebody hurt and there's a big lawsuit. Uh, they might stop it then, mm-hmm. but I, I, and I've said this time and time and time. Tony Khan, I met him. I don't know him well, but very very nice to me. Very you know, outgoing, with a love for wrestling that you don't see usually. But he's going to have to take control of this ship, and I know that's. That that's maybe not in his uh, orbit to be a hard ass, but he's going to have to because he's dealing with young guys who want to prove something. So, so when it gets to the po- point, that's why he has lawyers in the dressing room <laughs> <laughs> with the young books. <laughs> yeah. So he has lawyers in there and they're trying to oversee all this stuff, but I don't know. Here's the thing, right? So, with that being said, uh, AEW's crack staff of Aubrey Edwards slash Don Stevens is only deleting or making copyright strike claims against channels which are negative towards AEW. Now, moving on to... Uh, and also, just on something else uh, you were saying before, it seems a lot easier to have somebody take down a video on Twitter than to change the culture of uh, wrestling in AEW locker rooms so these botches don't happen in the first place. So it's sort of, it's not fixing anything. It's just sort of like, to a point, like giving bad will towards their own company by sort of going after people who point out the bad things Mm -hmm. in the company that everyone agrees are bad things. Now, I wanted to make mention of the second point because AEW and Don Stevens also targeted my fellow YouTuber, Stevie Richards. What? Yep. Go ahead. And the uh, who did a breakdown of the uh, pile drivers that Ray Fenix did on John Moxley, and they were it was on a screen behind him. And as you know, I've explained this to you beforehand. It's like there's automatic like this content ID recognizers. So if we show like a piece of footage from WWE here, then content ID would spot it and say, "Hey, that video belongs to WWE," and then they'll do whatever they'll do. Where, uh, in Stevie's case, this didn't happen because this was a manual review or manual claim by Don Stevens, who sought out. What do you mean? A, what do you mean a manual claim? She well, did it on her own. Yes, exactly. It wasn't an automatic process where AEW recognized. Oh, that's AEW footage. Uh, mm-hmm. a, someone in AEW saw that video, made a manual claim, actually wrote into YouTube and said, "We want this removed." And so Stevie in particular was targeted in that one, which is a bit ridiculous, especially considering that he has the rights to use bits of that footage, copyright footage for the review, uh, for the reasons of review, critique, criticism. Mm -hmm. And that falls under that remit definitely because he was talking about the move. He was, you know, going backwards and forwards, you know, rewinding, analyzing every bit of it. What was the end result of that? They take it down? Yeah. He they took did down, take yeah, it down. Took down the video, and they also, I think, tried to take down uh, his Patreon video, where because he up because he's got a Patreon, Stevie Richards as well. Free plug for you, Stevie, uh, f- with some extra like breakdown videos and um, reviews and critiques of moves and stuff like that. And they also how went do you, after his how Patreon. do you know so much about how do you know so much about this? And I know nothing. That's what I'm paid to know about, I suppose. I'm the YouTube guy. You're the wrestling personality with all the good stories. <laughs> well, we could do it the other way if you I, like. I, you do I the thought, YouTube thing. I, I, okay, this is my extent of my knowledge. 
you can use up to 16 seconds or 18 seconds for educational purposes. I don't know Is the timings. Anything? I don't know how many seconds. But for educational purposes, you can okay. show something. Yes or no? I don't know about the seconds, but yeah, for certain reasons, it's like Dark Side of the Ring. They've been showing WWE footage for years, and it's perfectly mm-hmm. legal and allowed to because it's a documentary. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse well, me. Well, keep me updated on the uh, Stevie Richards case because we may have to get our special lawyer on this case. Who's that? Zeb. Who's Jim, who's Jim Cornette's lawyer? Oh, Stephen P. New. We may have to get Stephen P. New on this. And by God, we'll get to the bottom of it. Mm. Well, you make the call. I'm not doing long distance. Right, we're moving <laughs> on then. Adam Cole, uh, I think you've seen the video of how he did it. And yep. you've seen uh, the shot on Dynamite a couple of days ago about him basically saying he can't wrestle. Well, there you go. Uh, tell me what you saw on the video and just how oh. unfortunate that is. Okay, you see these guys on AW, uh, AEW, they're coming off 20-foot ladders and doing all this, and they're getting up and walking away. And here comes Adam Cole kind of running to the ring and br- breaks his ankle. Just a simple trot down the ramp, around the ring, and then his ankle's broke. And they do all this other stuff that looks like it should have killed you, and nothing happens. Nobody gets hurt that I hear of. Uh, and here comes Adam Cohen and, and, and breaks his ankle. It's where's the justice? Where is the justice in this business? It's did, not. Did you find that back in the day as well? That like people in the territories when they get injured, they just get injured on the just the silliest things. Oh yeah, it's always it, whatever. It is, it's I not the known, big things. It's the tiny things you've done a hundred times before. Tom Pritchard, one time was working in Tennessee. He broke his leg and worked at least a week on a broke leg. He knew it was hurting. He didn't know it was broke, broken. And then he found out it, it was broken. And But he had worked a week on a broken leg. And that shows you how much better the business has, has gotten since those days. Because if you didn't work in those days, you didn't get paid. I thought you were going to say the opposite. So it's Adam Cole, What's I don't that? care if your ankle's broken. Get out there. Tom did. <laughs> yeah, that's what we should say. But but he uh, he was in the ring doing an interview, and his leg was all taped up. It, it went all the way up to his knee. Mm. So it must have been a, a bigger break than what I thought. But that's the way guys used to do. They would just get, they would just get hurt on the silliest things. Uh, this changes one of the promoters. Well, in fact, it changes a match at the pay-per-view on Sunday. It doesn't matter. We're going to move on now. This was something you said you didn't understand, so uh, I've got to uh, sort of explain it a bit better. Mark, uh, Mark, Brock Lesnar versus Mark Hunt's legal fight that has been raging since 2016. First of all, who's Mark Hunt? Mark Hunt is the... Uh, was he Australian or New Zealand? Anyway, he was a uh, fighter, UFC fighter. He fought Brock Lesnar at UFC 200. He lost uh-huh. in, I believe, off the top of my head, a three-round decision to Brock. And then he tried to sue UFC and Dana White and Brock Lesnar and everybody else. Because uh, he claimed that UFC knowingly allowed Brock Lesnar to participate in that fight even though, uh, he claims, even though Dana White and UFC and everybody knew he was doping. Hmm. So when was this suit filed? This suit was filed uh, a good few years ago, at least six years ago. So I'm sorry, I'm just writing something down there. Let me read this to you. On Tuesday, a federal judge in Nevada struck down the rest of Hunt's case against his former promoter, which was revived in 2021 when an appeals court reversed previous dismissals of battery, fraud, and conspiracy claims against the UFC, Dana White, and Brock Lesnar in connection with Hunt's ill-fated fight against the WWE star on July 9th, 2016. U.S. District Judge Jennifer A. Dorsey found Hunt failed to uh, prove the trio knowingly misled him that Lesnar would not be using performance-enhancing drugs in connection with their UFC 200 bout and conspired to book it despite previous knowledge that Lesnar was doping. Now, it should also be said that Lesnar, after the fight, it was announced that he had tested positive for something or other, some banned substance. So, So they kicked it out? 
Yeah. Even though he tested positive after the fight. Yeah. The, the which law- means that he would have tested positive during the fight. Mm-hmm. And that's what it was about. Yeah, but, I don't understand that at all. Well, the lawsuit alleges that obviously Brock Lesnar would have known because he did it. Mm-hmm. But uh, the lawsuit alleges that the UFC and Dana White knew that Brock Lesnar was on uh, banned substances when they let him fight. Of course they did. You think? Um, oh, yeah. They knew that. Because look at Brock. He's a physical specimen. I'm sure he just didn't doesn't get there naturally. But what was the guy suing for? The money amount. Uh, it doesn't say the money, money amount. Well, you know what my interest is in that subject? <laughs> my interest level is like this. So, hey, I hate the guy. I'm on the guy of the, the guy that I'm on the plaintiff side because I, I think they all knew it and let him because they had it all advertised. If they if they had changed it. Uh, they would have lost some money, mm-hmm. and I don't know. They, they I, test I'm them on, months out. I'm, I'm a, how often do they test before a fight? Now, with USADA. And how, how close to the fight do they test? Uh, with USADA, you're always in the testing pool unless you declare that you're retired. So uh-huh. they can test you whenever they want, essentially. They can knock on your door at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, do a little whittle in this cup and we're going to take it away. And and you have to let them know, you know, when you're going on holiday, where you're going to be. They're really, really strict with fighters. Uh, so if they want to test you, you have to let them know where you're going to be, essentially, your major plans, like many, many months in advance. Well, how close to the fight did, did, uh, did Brock test? Good question. And who is to know that who acts, who's that actual urine was used. Mm. Have you uh, have you ever heard the story about Sid and Harvey Whippleman, downtown Bruno? Yeah, I've heard some stories. I know those guys pretty well. Mm. Have you heard the uh, one did a wee wee for the other to pass a test? Uh, I'm I'm sure Harvey did the wee wee for Sid. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sure of that, but. Let me uh, let me bring this up to you. So this actually brings up the point. So why did WWE? I talked to him not too long ago. Oh really? Yep. Good guy. When's he coming on? Uh, he wants to come on. Does he? He's got some great stories. Oh, we've got to have him on. Great stories. He does. Let me let me tell you this. And so uh, the thing I want to bring to your attention is: so why did UFC's testing pull up? Brock Lesnar was using a, a banned substance. I think it was like a diuretic or something like that, where it basically cleans your body of uh, yep. performance enhancing drugs. So why didn't WWE's performance uh, 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 wellness policy pick that up? It's because Brock Lesnar is not tested, and he has it written into his contract that he doesn't have to do any drug tests. And apparently that's the same for him, and that's the same for other part-time wrestlers. Hmm, I didn't know that. So... Brock in his contract now that he has signed mm-hmm. and maybe might sign another one, he has it written in that he doesn't get tested for anything. Supposedly so. That's what's in his contract. Wow. So that's I can do it, but you don't do it. One rule for them. One rule yeah. for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Well, I can see it being done. I know this sounds weird, but did you have to have to do a test when you were doing the Zeb Coulter thing in the mid twenty tens? Did I do a test? What are you saying? I was on drugs. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, hopefully that you weren't on drugs no. when you did the test. Yes, I did. I did do it, and I would ask, "Why in the hell <laughs> am I doing a damn drug test? I'm not touching nobody, and nobody's touching me." See, it wasn't written in my contract that. Nobody could touch me, but I was told by the guy that they they got rid of on talent relations. Mark, no, I forgot what his name. He, but he said I wasn't to be touched. I, he said if anybody brings up doing a finish, 
that they're going to hit you or they're going to do this. You tell them not no, but hell no. And we did something one night and it was never brought up. And I had kind of forgotten about it because I still have that wrestler mentality at the time. And somebody hit me and, but they shouldn't have hit me. And I come out and I noticed they kept hanging around me. How, how are you? How you doing? If I'd have known then what I know now, I would have went, I'm feel good. Oh, I just fell out to take me to the hospital. Oh God. Oh, I'm, I'm having visions and <laughs> we can see into the future now. <laughs> oh my. I did go to Las Vegas. Here's another story. I've never told okay. went to Las Vegas. This is a short story. And I rode to, we went to LA. We rode to Vegas. I, I forgot who I rode with now, some other guy. And I got there. And when I was, I got out of the car, there was a, an Uber driver. I swear to God, he hit me with the car, not hard, but he knocked me down. I should have stayed down, but I got up and I was cussing. I was mad more than anything else because he wasn't paying attention. He wasn't going one mile an hour, but the car kept inching forward and I was trying to get away from it. And I just couldn't, it knocked me down in Vegas. So, and the guy says, Hey, here, here's $20, man. I said, get the fuck out of here. I don't want your $20. Hell you damn near kill me. But, but I, I never even reported it. So, I, but I should have. Uh, Bruce Pritchard's told a story about you in a car once when you were in Impact. You see how good I am to people, James. What did you say? You broke up there. Yeah, I know the internet got a bit weird there. You were frozen for a few seconds. It, it, it sure did. Uh, okay. Bruce Pritchard told a story about you in Impact in 2017. This was after you'd done your legging. And he you said, broke up again, too. Oh. It's your internet. Your internet's terrible at the moment. It's, it's, it's glowing Stop red. Stop it. It's, uh, why is it always you had to be me? It's glowing red. I can see it. Or yellow now. Oh, what's that mean? Uh, it means your internet's terrible. It's, got, it's gone back to white now. That's the good one. Right. Okay. So Bruce Pritchard said, in 2017, you were going to your... I don't know if you were going to your car or whatever. You were getting out of... Um, I think you were still in the, the rascal thing at the time. Uh -huh. And you got out of it to stand up and you leant on a car to stand up and mm. then the car <laughs> do you remember yes. it say it I, I remember it go on no but i wasn't i wasn't in my deal I, I just you know i was i was just getting out of the car and bruce i guess and somebody else behind, and they had gathered around there was another car behind us they were in that car and and we were talking <laughs> And while they were talking, I was said, well, you know, the way I look, and I leaned back, and the guy was going forward. <laughs> and I went, whoa. And I just took the big bop over. And they all run over, you're okay, you're okay. I said, yeah, I'm fine. Bob Ryder was, yeah, but he was a, he, he was a good guy. He, he really was. And everybody laughed at my expense, of course. Of course, I laughed with him because it was kind of funny. It didn't hurt me anyway. So, but, and he told that. Yeah, he told that some some time ago i don't know when but uh, I, I remember hearing that and he just bruce is like he's tough isn't he dutch he just you know he just falls straight over and then he just dusts himself up and he, off and he's fine again <laughs> oh yeah so but it that really happened it did mm. uh okay we've got a couple more bits of news and we'll probably end the podcast on a couple of questions where you essentially grill yourself because you sent me a load of questions uh, that I think some fans had sent you, and just some questions you hey, thought were a good idea. Here, here, here's some news for you. Okay, I'm gonna try to Harvey Whippleman. I'm gonna try to get him on the show, and I'm gonna try to get one of your personal favorites, Jamie Dundee. We've been trying for ages, though. Well, he wrote me yesterday. Oh, did he? He wrote me, and yes, we have been trying for a long time to get him on. Hell, it took me six months to get Ricky Morton on. Oh, my God. Well, he flew off but, after 40 minutes as well. Yeah. What the hell? I mean, folks, I know what the problem is now. It's this international interviewing. You're over there in Manchester, England. Is mm -hmm. that where you are? Yep. And how many hours are you away from New York time? We're five hours six. ahead. Five. Okay. So 
but five o'clock in the afternoon is 12 o'clock or, or if you do it earlier, see doing these morning interviews, throws throws these guys off. So I know, but I just, do you know, when we're done, it's like 7 PM. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm hungry. You know, you're hungry right now, aren't you? I'm, I'm really hungry, but it's only five. <laughs> So uh, we have to do this for a, we don't have to, but we enjoy doing it for God's sake. This is a lovely thing to do. Is the oh, I, I I I enjoy this. Right. Next on the agenda, we've probably got a couple of questions. Hulk Hogan has got married for the third time. And he's definitely got a type. Uh, once again, yeah. blonde. So you know sure he's, he's got to love the blonde ones. Uh, Hogan getting married again at the age of what seventy almost. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's 70 years old. She's 45. So, and she's a nice looking girl, hmm? nice looking lady. So, what attracted you to the millionaire Hulk Hogan? <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. But, uh, hey, this is all I can say. I wish him success. I wish him happiness. Her too. So, and hope anybody doesn't come out. Any weird stories about you, Hulk? Not like that damn, that, what was the guy's name that was the DJ in Tampa? Bubba Florida. the Love Sponge. Bubba the Love Sponge, you know, with the tape and all that. So, but he only made $30 million from that. Mm. You know that? Do you think he got actually paid all that money? Because I think, was no. it like the biggest libel suit, uh, you know, prize ever won by anyone ever in the history of the really? world? Yeah, yeah, really? he got like 140 million or something. He was he was awarded by the judge. 140 million. Something crazy. It was nine figures. Well, damn. Help with that money. Hell, I'm, I'll, I'll do that sex reassignment surgery. I'll, <laughs> I'll go meet him myself. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, sorry, Hulk Hogan gets $115 million verdict. Bollier versus Gorka. I wonder how much he actually got out of that because obviously Gorka will have just declared bankruptcy i think gawker did mm. i mean they don't exist but anymore. If, if, but but if they file bankruptcy he can just get what they got left mm. i don't think he got a hundred million dollars no, let me say that i doubt that I either. Um, he probably got 500 bucks and some coupons to mcdonald's he could have got that do you have the thing at mcdonald's with the monopoly Oh, we do. We have that. Yeah, we just had it over here as well. It's the only time I go to McDonald's in the year, just because, just because it's just like the most mild form of gambling, and I and I usually win a free six chicken McNuggets. So, who who was Hulk's first wife? What was her name? Linda. And what was his second wife's name? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't realize you were going to be grilling me on the other wives. I know Linda was the first one, and and she Linda took was him. The to, first one. She took him to the. She cleaners. took him to the. No, no kidding. She she. She cleaned him up, cleaned him out too. So anyway, Hulk, we'll wrap this up. Congratulations. Hope you're happy. Uh, one more thing about that. Brooke Hogan refused to attend explaining, well, not even explaining, just said, I'll, I'll read it out, but this is like the most like bland way of saying it. As we all experience this with our own families, the dynamics of a family unit, uh, unit continuously change over the years. With that being said, my family has experienced a lot of change. Well, all of that happening in the public eye. I've had to learn how to best navigate those changes as they come, which has been difficult to say the least. For my own journey to healing and happiness, I've chosen to create some distance between myself and my family, and I'm focusing on people and things that heal my heart and align with my own personal beliefs, goals, and values. I wish him well. What a weird thing to post. It's stupid. What, what does it even mean anyway? And once you say, well, you why don't out. you just wish, wish him happiness and move on? Nobody gives us shit what she says. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but if you even see, I don't even know what you said right now. I just heard it, but I still don't even know. She was saying, hey, I'm just going to stay away from you guys. You guys stay away from me. That's basically what you said. Yeah, it's basically when people say personal beliefs aligning and stuff like that. It's like, shut up. Just say, mm -hmm. I hate him. He hates me. We've had a big fallout. Deal with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. There's two things we can talk about, but I don't think we could be bothered talking about either. So I'll ask something more interesting. It was going to be Matt Hardy and CM Punk, and it was going to be Soraya, a.k.a. Page's stolen gear. Mm -hmm. Any interest in either of those topics to talk about, or should we talk about what, uh, some of the things you've sent me for the last 20 minutes of the show? Yeah, let's uh, 
Let's talk about my stuff. Yeah. Okay. About the Soraya stuff. She lost it. Who knows if she lost it or not? Mm. I mean, it it probably got stolen. Mm. No, yeah. That was it stolen. Where did she lose it? Airport? Uh, Supposedly someone robbed. In fact, I'll give you the thing. Heads up to the public. All my wrestling gear has recently gone missing, including some items that I owned for 10 years and had sentimental value. Jackets, my return gear, Wembley gear, Outcast gear, the whole lot. Luckily, I have two jackets left, but I would love for you guys to keep an eye out on the internet and auction sites because someone may wind up selling stuff eventually. If you hear anything, please contact so-and-so with the subject line of Soraya gear, AEW tickets, and an autograph to anyone that leads uh, to the recovery of these items. And the thing How much got, money? Uh, no, no money. Just autographs and tickets. Oh, well, hell, that's not worth a damn. Mm. Offer some money, Soraya, and you might get your stuff back. Yes. Right, so we Nobody shall... wants to go to an AEW show. <laughs> that's, like, uh, yeah. that's like being punished. <laughs> well, maybe if like if you uh if you find me the stuff back, you don't have to go to an AEW show ever again. Okay, that that'll work. That's probably work better. Well you used to say, hey, you know, I'm, charge I'm, him I'm, to well, wait a you are saying anti AEW stuff and who's the person that watches over the what Don Stevens on... will be after us. That's right. She could come after you. No, I'll just direct it to you. I, I plead no low contendere. <laughs> I don't, and I don't even know what that means. So uh, what's your next question? Okay, so you sent me some questions, some from the fans and some just talking points that you, basically you're interviewing yourself here. And <laughs> I was looking through, a few of them we've addressed before and have got rid of them off the list. Now, let me have a look. We've talked about that one recently. We have talked about, uh, we've talked about that one recently. But number three. How did ECW suddenly take off back in the early days, and where did Paul Heyman get inspiration to book ECW? Who wrote that? I did. Well, you sent it me. Yeah. What's the question now? Where did DEW take off to? No, no, no. no. Why did ECW take off so suddenly? Oh. I was going to say, you you wrote me this question. I thought you'd have an answer. I I did. (laughs) Because ECW... Paul Heyman went to Memphis and studied the Memphis style of booking. And it was wild and it was out in the crowd. And and this was every week. And somebody asked me one time, why did you guys do those that wild stuff in Memphis? I said, guy, we had to draw people the next week. We ran Memphis 52 times a year. So you have one bad TV. Guess what? They lose interest. They don't come. Now, you have two weeks like that or three weeks like that. Now you're really on your butt. Now you're having to rekindle stuff that you may have planned later on down down the line. But he, he took that stuff from Memphis, and he took it back to Philadelphia, which I call a virgin area, virgin territory. And he showed them there, and they they fell in love with it. So then he got in that little bingo hall and did all this crazy stuff. And he he would seat like a a thousand people, but they were live. Then he got his TV going, and they took off. But he got his inspiration for that type show from the old Memphis territory. So there's blood and guts. Now. ECW wasn't a territory, strictly speaking, not like Smoky Mountain or USWA no. in the nineties, because they only ran weekends, and the you know they do they wouldn't do regular. Uh, they go to the ECW arena every few weeks, I think, and then they do spot shows uh, the rest of the weekends here, there, and everywhere. In the first few years, they weren't they were drawing a couple of hundred people. You know, mm-hmm. they were they were struggling just as much as everyone else were. But why did ECW end up? gaining in popularity and building on the business where USWA couldn't during well, that time frame. USWA had been there for, I guess, probably at the time they went out of business, they were probably, they had been as a, uh, as a company, not USWA, but it was just, it, they referred to it as just wrestling. People used to didn't say, oh, the name of the company. They say wrestling or wrestling. And everybody knew what they were talking about. And USWA didn't decline all on its own because it was the growth of WCW 
and WWF because when because that's like saying how you going to keep them happy down on the farm after they've seen the big lights of Broadway and when they saw what WWF they brought it there the lights and the music and and then even WCW it's the same thing so you had two companies and then Channel 5 was like just a a, a TV studio type and it wasn't exciting like it was before. They had more choices, and they chose to go with either WWF or, or, or WCW. So why? That's why. Yeah, but uh, I mean, you know, the people in Philly will have been watching WWF and WCW as well. But was it just purely because they hadn't had a territory there for decades? Yes, and but see, W. Okay, you got to study styles now. The WWE style for years and years and years. Actually, before, right when Vince took it over, the style was slow and plodding. I mean, they'd have these guys that were like 40, 45 years old, weigh about 300 pounds. They weren't fast. They weren't taking any bumps. They were just caricatures of what they used to have, like the Germans and the, the Japanese guys and maybe a gay guy or something. You really can't do that stuff now, but but when you when he got to the guys that could do a little more, like like the Sandman, Sandman would go to the ring every week, drunk or in hell, but the people loved him. So that's what he that's what he had in his favor. At the same time. Philadelphia on their TV station, Philadelphia has a population of about 4 million in the metro area, I guess, maybe more. You know what the metro population of Memphis was? Wasn't it like six, seven hundred, something like that? Or am I going crazy there? And, and, and this no, and this extends out about 80 miles from the center of the TV station. And it would go over in Arkansas and Mississippi and you know, maybe almost all the way to the tip of Kentucky, but they they had a a viewership of about back in the day it would have probably five six hundred thousand people, but the metro area of Memphis only had like four hundred thousand. But I'm I'm talking about the sixty miles out that the that the TV signal would cover. Mm-hmm. But look at look at Philadelphia when they were there. Had four million people, and they still only put a thousand thousand people in there, and they didn't run every week. Mm-hmm. So they would run, I don't know what, once a month, once every six weeks. Yeah, probably once every like three for TV tapings or Memphis every four weeks. ran. Memphis ran once a week on Monday nights for years. Philadelphia's metro population is now, anyway, six million two hundred forty-five thousand. So yeah, it's a far we'll, bigger. We'll take a take a million off that for the last ten years. And yeah, we about got it. Uh, very quickly before we shut this podcast down, with the relative success at the time, you know, in ninety-six, ninety-seven, with ECW's formula of you know more hardcore blood and guts and all that kind of thing, did USWA ever look at that and think, man, we really need to start? like ramping up the violence here? Or do, would that just not have played in the area? They were used to it. Listen, it was talent that you could get. If you you had talent, you were looking to go to WWF or a wrestler was looking to go to WCW or even ECW. Nobody was really dying to go to Memphis because it just the business... I mean, they did, the money wasn't there, and they they wouldn't give you a a guarantee because hell they were losing money, so it was just at a, at a plane to where it was just it was going for that soft landing of going out of business. I think on that we're going to go out of business as well. Uh, I'm actually going to close this podcast up a I don't know about ten minutes early because then we can dedicate a bit more time to answering your questions. And we are going to be doing that on Tuesday's episode. Every single Tuesday, ask Dutch anything. Questions for Dutch at gmail.com if you want your question submitted for consideration to be asked to the dirty Dutchman himself, the crafty veteran. 
but for now. You know, you know what something I thought of? Go on. Some of these people go online and like charge for people to ask questions. Mm. We don't do that. No, we've discussed this before where like you just do like a live show and then people like do the huge, you know, like Kenny Boland does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he wants to come back on too. He loves you. Hey, does, uh, (laughs) (laughs) oh, he does. He he, he likes you a lot. Uh, Rip, your, your newest client. Van Winkle. Rip Rogers. Rip Rogers. Is he doing a podcast now with you? No, not with me. He's got his own podcast. Uh, he was on my main channel, WSI, uh, two, three months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it got a lot of really favorable uh, feedback as well, that one. So mm-hmm. it was nice. It was funny, actually, because I was... <laughs> I won't say what it was, but before we went recording, uh, I said, uh, Rip, is there any... And I say this to everybody. Rip, is there anything you don't want me to ask you? And he said, yes, I don't want you to ask me about this thing. And I said, oh, why not? And he began to give me like a three-minute in really impassioned answer. And then I could just hear his like regular co-host in the back just go, well, goddamn, Rip, I mean, you've never been that animated when I've done the podcast with you, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, why didn't he want you to ask him? No, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you off air. Because he said, he, said uh, he didn't want to talk about it. And then he talked about it, but he didn't do it on the podcast. So I'll tell you as soon okay. as we close up. I, can I ask you a question for oh. everybody? Did it include Randy Savage? No. Okay. I'll tell. I'll they, t- got I'll, a, they got a lot of stories. I know. I know. Uh, I think I did ask him about that, though. And he said uh, about the fight with Randy Savage. And he said, well, we found out, you know, we fought and then I found out two things. Yeah, it's like I couldn't I fight. I can't fight, and neither could but he. But he can't either. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he told me that one time. But that's an old joke. I know. But but it but it was funny as hell. I wasn't there that night, but because you know Randy Savage had an explosive temper. So and and Rip had been with him for years and years and years. I don't know what they got into it about. It was in Louisville, so. Hey, well, if you want to find out, then send us a check and Dutch will answer yeah. that question. Yeah, send me a check. Every question, 10 bucks, and I'll answer it. There we go. Right. Sounds like a deal to me. Or you can go to questionsfordutch at gmail.com while we work out the live question submission kind of thing. But for now, thank you very much for watching. And Dutch, we the people. We the people.